Hi there, I'm Jeremy Krug, and in this video we're taking a look at AP Chemistry Unit 7, Section 9, which is all about what happens when you have a system at equilibrium and then you disturb that equilibrium. By the way, if you haven't subscribed yet, consider subscribing because that way you'll have instant access to the entire AP Chemistry curriculum here on my channel, as well as some great review videos and problem walkthroughs and all kinds of good stuff. Now, when we talk about disturbing a system at equilibrium, this is Le Chatelier's principle that helps us to understand this. It basically says that anytime you have a system at equilibrium and that system is disturbed, the system is going to shift itself in order to counteract that disturbance and it's going to return to equilibrium. Now, in order to illustrate this, let's take a look at the same thought experiment that we looked at way back in section one of this unit. And that is the dance floor problem. You might remember if you're following along with these videos, that we had a, a dance, maybe it's a prom, homecoming or something, and there were 300 people uh, at this dance, and we found that after every song, 30% of the people who were dancing sat down, and likewise, after every song, 20% of the people who weren't dancing got up and started dancing. So once we did that for a few songs, we found that there was an equilibrium where pretty much, no matter what happened, 30% of 119 is 36, and 20% of 181 is also 36, and so you have a net change of zero. And so for all practical purposes, as long as this dance continues, you'll always have 119 people on the dance floor and 181 people that are not dancing. Well, what happens if we throw some party crashers into the mix? So once again, we're going to disturb the dance floor equilibrium. And we do that by throwing 30 party crashers. Now, when party crashers show up, usually they, they will show up on the not dancing side. Like we said in the last video, people as they walk into the gymnasium or into the building are not dancing their way into the building. Usually that's not how it works. And so we're going to put the 30 party crashers on the not dancing side. Now, this changes things, doesn't it? Because 30% of 119 is still 36, but 20% of 211 is actually 42. So notice we have a net change of positive 6 in the direction of the dance floor. So the dance floor goes up by 6, and the not dancing side goes down by 6. And we can do this again. 30% of 125 is 38 and 20% of 205 is 41. So after the next song, we have a net change of plus three in the direction of the dance floor. So the dance floor goes up to 128, the not dancing side goes down uh, to 202. And we do it again, you know, 38 and 40. This time after this song, it's a net change of plus two in the direction of the dance floor. So the dance floor goes up to 130, and the not dancing side goes down to 200. We can do this again. You know, 30% of 130, 39. 20% of 200 is 40. So we have a net change of plus 1 in the direction of the dance floor. So this goes to 131. The not dancing side goes down to 199. And we can do it again. The 30% of 131 is 39. 20% of 199 is 40. So once again, it's a plus one in the direction of the dance floor, like this. And watch what happens now. If we take 30% of that 132, we get 40. And 20% of our 198 is 40. So guess what? We are back at dance floor equilibrium. And we have a net change of zero. So it's still 132 and 198. And of course, we could do this again, and you'd notice that the numbers stay the same. So let's analyze what happened here in our revised dance floor problem with the party crashers. What was the eventual effect of throwing an additional 30 people onto this not dancing side? Well, after that change took place, after that disturbance or that disruption took place, notice that the side where we added the party crashers to actually went down. And it actually caused an increase in 
the other side of the process. Now guess what? The same thing happens when we add substances in a chemical reaction. If we have uh, any reaction at equilibrium, and when you add a substance, it actually causes an increase in the other side of the reaction. So for example, if we have this balanced equation right here, and it's at equilibrium, and everything seems like it's uh, fairly stable, but all of a sudden, we decide to add some hydrogen sulfide gas into the mix. Well, guess what? It's going to cause the carbon disulfide and the hydrogen gases to increase, while the methane and the hydrogen sulfide will decrease after that change. Now, what if you do it to the other side? Well, same type of idea. If we decide to add some carbon disulfide instead to this process at equilibrium, well, we're going to cause methane and hydrogen sulfide gases to increase, and then the carbon disulfide and hydrogen gases would decrease. So you add a substance, it causes an increase in the other side of the reaction. And of course, the side where you added it is going to have to go down in, in, uh, in order to make that other side increase. Now, when a substance is removed, it causes an increase on the same side of the reaction. So this is kind of the converse of what we saw in that other example. So if you have this process at equilibrium and you decide to remove some carbon disulfide, well, it's going to cause that equilibrium to shift farther to the right. And you'll make more carbon disulfide and more hydrogen. And the, the methane and the hydrogen sulfide will go down. Likewise, if you have this at equilibrium and instead you decide to remove some methane, well, the equilibrium is going to shift in order to replace, replenish the methane. So the methane will increase, hydrogen sulfide will increase, and then the two other things here, CS2 and hydrogen, will go down. That's why, by the way, in industry, whenever they are making a product, maybe in this process they're trying to make, well, I don't know, carbon disulfide or something, well, what they're going to do is, as it's created, they're going to try to remove that carbon disulfide from the mix. That way that equilibrium keeps shifting so that it replenishes and keeps producing that carbon disulfide. And of course, if you're in industry, you're, you're trying to make more of the product. So that's what you're going to do. Now, there are some things that do not affect equilibrium at all. Things like adding an inert gas. And when I say inert gas, I'm talking about any gas that doesn't really participate in that chemical reaction. It has no effect on it. So for example, if we had this and we decided to add some random gas like neon or nitrogen or something, it's not going to have any effect on that reaction equilibrium. And likewise, adding a catalyst does not affect equilibrium. In Unit 5, we talked about how adding a catalyst speeds up a reaction. We talked about how it does that, but it doesn't shift or affect equilibrium whatsoever. So let's take a look at this process here, and let's find out what's going to happen to the concentration of carbon dioxide gas if each of the following changes is made when it is at equilibrium. So what happens if we add oxygen gas? Well, we're adding oxygen, so it's going to shift it in the other direction. So that means carbon dioxide, along with water vapor, are going to increase, aren't they? What's going to happen if we add water vapor, however? Well, if we add water vapor, it's going to cause the reaction to shift in the other direction. So we'll make more oxygen, right? But we're going to decrease the water and the carbon dioxide. It will go down. And hopefully that makes sense, because if you add water, it's going to have to react with some of that carbon dioxide, which means that it's going to have to go down, isn't it? How about adding octane to the reaction mixture? What's going to happen if we add octane? The answer is no change. Now, why is that? Well, this was not intended to, intended to be a trick question. Sometimes it, it might have been. I don't know. But octane is a liquid. And since it is a liquid, it has no effect on equilibrium. 
So octane as a liquid is not even a part of that equilibrium mixture. How about removing some water vapor from the reaction mixture? Well, if you remove water vapor, it's going to shift in order to replenish that water vapor. So we're going to make more water. We're going to make more carbon dioxide as well, aren't we? So it's going to increase. What about if we remove oxygen gas? Well, if you remove oxygen gas, the reaction is going to try to replenish that, isn't it? So that means we're going to make more oxygen. We're going to have the carbon dioxide and water go down. So it's going to decrease. So that's what happens. How about adding some argon gas to the reaction vessel? Well, argon's not even in this reaction, is it? So the answer is no change. Now there are some other things we can do to a reaction mixture. One thing we can do is change the pressure inside the reaction vessel. Now the easiest way to, to change the pressure of the vessel is to change the volume. If you want to increase the pressure, you just you know decrease the volume. You smash it down where it's smaller. If you increase the volume, that's going to decrease the pressure. Now the way this works is if you have a reaction and you increase the pressure by decreasing the volume, it's going to shift the equilibrium toward the side that has fewer moles of gas. And that would be the reactant side in this particular reaction because we have 1 plus 2, which is 3 moles of gas on the reactant side. Whereas on the product side, we have 1 plus 4 or 5 moles of gas. And since 3 moles of gas take up less space than 5 moles of gas, when you decrease the volume, it's going to shift toward the side that takes up less space. So that would be the, the reactant side in this particular reaction. On the other hand, if you increase the volume, which is the same as decreasing the pressure essentially, it's going to shift toward the side that has more moles of gas because that's the side that takes up more space. You increase your, your, your space, you're going to uh, increase the amount of stuff and, in, and basically occupy that space. So it's going to shift toward the, the right in this case. So let's try this example again. We have that same reaction. What's going to happen if we increase the pressure? So that's decreasing the volume. Well, it's going to go toward the side that has fewer moles of gas. So we have 25 moles of gas versus about 34. So it's going to shift toward the left side. That means carbon dioxide will go down. It will decrease. Likewise, if we decrease the pressure, it's going to go toward the side that has more moles of gas because that's the side that takes up more space. So carbon dioxide, along with water vapor, would increase if you uh, carried out that change. So you can add materials, you can take materials away, you can change the pressure. What else can you do to a system at equilibrium? Well, there's only one other thing that I can think of, and that's changing the temperature. Now, this is really the only way to change the actual equilibrium constant. We talked about that earlier in this unit. If you change the temperature, then you are changing the equilibrium constant, but you're also changing the direction in which it's going to go. So here's that same reaction, that, uh, once again this time, but this time I'm giving you delta H. And why am I doing that? Well, it makes a difference. In this case, this reaction is exothermic. In fact, it's very exothermic. It gives off 11,000 kilojoules per mole in that reaction. So since it's exothermic, that means heat is a product, isn't it? So I can actually write plus heat as a product. Raising the temperature is the same as adding heat, isn't it? So if I raise the temperature, I'm essentially adding a product. And it's going to shift equilibrium back toward the side of the reactants. So I'm going to make more oxygen. I'll make more reactants at the expense of the products. Now, the other uh, case is true as well. If you lower the temp temperature, that's the same thing as removing heat, isn't it? So if you lower the temperature, you take away heat, and it's going to make carbon dioxide and water 
at the expense of the reactants that you have present there. Now, if the reaction had been endothermic, heat would be a reactant, so it would be the opposite of all those things. We'll actually see an example of that here in a moment. So let's try a couple examples. In fact, this one actually is an, an endothermic reaction. And the question says, what's going to happen if we do all of these things? How about increase the temperature? Increase the temperature. Well, let's think about where heat is here. This is an endothermic reaction since delta H is positive. So that means heat is a reactant. And if we increase the temperature, we're adding heat, aren't we? So it's going to cause the equilibrium to shift toward the right, and we're going to make more carbon disulfide. It's going to go up, along with the hydrogen as well. And of course, if we decrease the heat, it's the opposite. We're taking away heat, so we have to replenish that by using up the products there. So CS2 is going to decrease. Here's another question. Which of the following changes is going to cause the actual equilibrium constant Kc for that above reaction to increase? Now, let's think about this. If I want to cause the equilibrium constant to increase, then I need to increase the amount of products I'm making, right? So how do I increase the amount of products I'm making and, uh, and get rid of these, these reactants over here? Well, I can add a reactant, right? And the only reactant that's going to change the equilibrium constant is adding heat. So if I add heat, that's the same thing as increasing the temperature, raising the temperature. I'm going to cause more CS2, more H2 to form at the expense of these reactants over here. The equilibrium constant goes up. Hope that makes sense to you. Hope you learn something about Le Chatelier's principle and understand more closely how this works. If you enjoyed the video, if you learned something here, please consider subscribing to my channel. That way you'll have access to all of these uh, AP Chemistry videos instantly and my AP review videos and problem walkthroughs. Hope to see you in the next video where we're going to talk about how we can determine if a reaction is going to go forward or backward or if it is at equilibrium. Thanks for joining me. Hope to see you in that next video.